Welcome everyone. My name is Greta Zaro. I'm the organizing director at World Beyond War and this is our closed bases webinar. Thank you for joining us. We are recording this webinar so you can view it later and share it with your friends and we are also live on Facebook at World Beyond War. Today I am joined by my co-host Mark Elliott Stein, one of the staff members at World Beyond War. Hi Mark. Hey everybody. World Beyond War is a grassroots global network of volunteers, activists, and allied organizations advocating for the abolition of war and its replacement with a just and sustainable peace. Today's webinar is all about our Closed Bases campaign. The United States has nearly 1 million active duty personnel stationed at over 1,000 domestic military bases. And on top of that, it has 150,000 military troops deployed outside the United States on over 800 bases in 80 countries worldwide, which is 95% of all foreign military bases. We are joined today by Leah Bolger, Tom Hastings, and Robert Rabin to talk about why military bases are problematic and how to run a grassroots campaign to shut down a military base. Let me introduce tonight's guests. Leah Bolger retired in 2000 from the US Navy at the rank of commander after 20 years of active duty service. Her career included duty stations in Iceland, Bermuda, Japan, and Tunisia. She witnessed firsthand the impact of US military bases abroad. Communities living near bases often experience high levels of rape committed by foreign soldiers, violent crimes, loss of land and livelihood, and pollution and health hazards. Welcome, Leah. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, no. Yeah. I'm, I'm uh, not, there we go. I think, is that, everybody sees a slide now? Yes, I we hope. can see your screen. Okay. All right. So the uh, military bases are nothing new for the United States. Uh, they started way back uh, when we were conquering the West. Uh, and uh, well, our first base was in Ohio called Fort Harmer. And then the numbers of them swiftly increased and moved westward to the Pacific Coast in order to facilitate the displacement and genocide of all the people that were in their way. Um, there's still a number of forts that are still active. Uh, for instance, Fort Meade, and most people have heard of that. It's in Maryland. And Fort Meade is the home of the Defense Information Systems, the U.S. Cyber Command, National Security Agency, and the Army Band. Oh, no. Oh, come on. There. Okay, sorry. All right. So um, the, um, <clears throat> the expansion of bases outside the United States began in 1940 when Britain wanted to expand its fleet but didn't have any money. So they negotiated a deal with FDR, whereby uh, we gave them 50 World War I era ships for 99 year leases on uh, British colonies. Uh, it gave them virtually sovereign powers over those colonies uh, in the Bahamas and other, other places in the Caribbean. And at the time it was called the most important action in the reinforcement of our national security since the Louisiana Purchase. And you'll see there's still a very big part of our quote national security. And now this chart shows the number and location of the over 800 military bases in over 80 countries. And uh, these increased uh, qualitatively and quantitatively after World War II and you'll notice that uh, most of the, our bases, are, or a large part of them, are, are uh, in Europe and um, Japan, Asia, Southeast Asia, and basically in the countries which uh, lost uh, World War II. And that's when the, they really started ramping up after World War II. And uh, the orange, or uh, the yellow category cir circles there depict bases, what we think of as a base where there's a gate and you drive through it and all those things. Um, the lily pad is something kind of a new term uh, that's new. It talks about, uh, it, it shows bases that are um, less than 200 people stationed on them. They're uh, very quickly set up and taken down. And so they pop up all over the place. 
And that's why there's uh, gray, uh, gray dots there to pick the unconfirmed lily pads because they, they sprout up very quickly. Uh, for instance, uh, when the Navy, or excuse me, when the military wants to um, uh, more easily launch uh, drone operations, for instance, several, several uh, lily pads have been opened in Africa for that purpose. So here, um, here are examples. On the left is Ramstein Air Base. It's huge. It's the biggest one in Europe. Um, and Ramstein is like a city. It has everything that a city would have, including a daycare center and swimming pool, golf course, churches, a uh, fitness center, all those things. And then on the right is a, a, a lily pad in Djibouti. And you can see it's much smaller, much less uh, desirable looking for a duty station, I would say. But that's the difference really between the two. There, there's a huge difference. So in addition to all those bases though, we also have uh, 11 aircraft carriers, which are considered, I mean, really they're mobile bases that can be put wherever uh, the United States feels that there's tensions are increasing and we want to show our presence, we move this base around. Although our presence probably creates the tension itself, I would say. But so a carrier is not just one thing. It's got all these ships with it. Uh, there's like 5,000 people on a carrier alone, but you also have destroyers and anti-missile defense stuff and communication stuff. So those are uh, part of the carrier strike group. Now, after World War II, um, the United States uh, started, became a superpower power, and now the, the fall of the USSR, we are now the sole remaining superpower, which we like to remind people of all the time. Um, this slide may be kind of a, a relevation for some people who, who don't know, but the United States government divides the world up into sections by which to better command them. And these are called uh, unified commands. There's North uh, Com uh, and South Com, uh, obviously, and European Command, African Command, Central Command, and Pacific Command. And Soon, um, unfortunately, we're going to have a seventh unified command, the Space Command, which has um, gotten a funding approved uh, from this latest NDAA to build the Space Command. And um, the, the, the military comes up with a, what they call their vision statement. And Vision 2020, uh, the title of it is Full Spectrum Dominance. And so this is why uh, the United States feels like it has to have uh, you know, its presence throughout the world for this full spectrum. And I suppose space really is, a, is just a bigger part of the spectrum. Um, I also would note that um, when I was on active duty, uh, the, they were planning, uh, the, the, the planning was for to be able to have uh, two major confrontations in two different parts of the world at the same time and planning for assets and, and whatever were based on that, that idea. <clears throat> and so you can see bases are now like the, the skeleton, the framework for American uh, military and foreign policy. Uh, a number of, uh, of, of people deployed, um, uh, upwards of 200,000. Uh, Greta said 150,000, I think it's more than that. Um, we have 50,000 in Germany alone, uh, another 50,000 or plus in Japan, which is a very small country. Uh, and, and about 70% of the Japanese uh, bases are on the small island of Okinawa. So there's almost 200,000 Americans stationed all over the world on military facilities. Uh, why does the US want them? Well, um, to establish their global presence, as I mentioned. Um, and then you've, I'm sure you've heard the expression that we have to fight them over there, so we won't have to fight them here. And, you know, I really think that's one of the main reasons that Americans can be so ambivalent about war is that it's not happening on our soil and we don't worry about becoming refugees or having our houses bombed. So that's a very important factor for American military policy is that it stays out of our our, our territory. Preposition weapons, uh, etc. Protect, I would protect and acquire, I would emphasize, natural resources and trade routes. And this uh, term, uh, AWOL, um, you may have heard it stands for a way without leave, but it also stands for American way of life. 
And uh, that is also a prime factor in, in uh, our, our military strategies. Um, joint exercises and training uh, with other countries. The, um, we give other countries billions of dollars worth of uh, what we call foreign aid, uh, but for the most part, that aid comes in the way of weapons. And they are, of course, American weapons that, that are paid for by your, your tax dollars. And we give them these uh, weapons, and then we conduct joint exercises and training uh, with those uh, countries uh, using our, our, our uh, equipment. Um, and our, you know, rules of engagement, all kinds of stuff. Mostly NATO countries, but, but other countries as well. And so um, an example of why, uh, ha how this happens, when I was stationed in Tunisia, there is not, there is no military base there, there's an embassy. And I worked in the Office of Defense Cooperation and there were, there was one person from the Army, one from the Air Force, I was a Navy person. And our, one of our functions was to uh, organize military exercises uh, with the host country. So uh, if it came to be a, a big military mm -hmm. battle where the United States wants to um, uh, use the facilities in t a country like Tunisia, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a big air base and there's a, a naval port. And because the United States has practiced using these facilities in the past, uh, they can, you know, they will commandeer them as their own uh, in the future, uh, I'm sure. So all those, all those uh, countries might not even have a base, but they still have, uh, represent American forward positioning or spectrum dominance or whatever. So why do some, some countries want them? And there are reasons. Uh, they do provide jobs. Uh, they can be a boost to the local economy because uh, Americans spend money out, off base. Some countries believe they are safer with the bases, although I would contend they're probably less safe and are considered a target for anybody wishing to do a, a America harm. Um, the United States builds facilities like airports and, and naval ports, uh, whether, the, whether the local people want them or not, for instance, in uh, uh, Jeju Island in South Korea, we're building a, a, a deep water naval port there that is destroying the environment and the local people don't want it, but uh, that's what the United States wants. Um, some countries want them so that our, their own military uh, isn't stretched so far if they need to use their military. Foreign aid, which I mentioned, they, they want to keep, continue keep, to keep getting the, the foreign aid. And obviously they want to maintain a relationship with the US and stay in our good graces or else. And that's what the United States threatens through either you know, military or economic means punishment if you don't cooperate with the United States. So there are a number of problems with these bases. Uh, uh, SOFA is a SOFA uh, stands for status of for forces agreement. And that is something that is between the United States government and the host government about rules of how they will operate. For instance, if an American uh, commits a crime off base and is arrested by the local um, uh, uh, police, they are turned over to the Americans for prosecution and punishment. And some SOFAs don't allow that, but, but some require that, that, that the, the person be turned back over to the American government. Uh, environmental damage. Uh, the Americans don't have to abide by local environmental laws. Uh, they don't have to allow um, local people to come in and even inspect for environmental damage. Uh, and not just, uh, not just oil, uh, you know, like uh, chemicals in the water, uh, but also noise pollution is a big problem. Uh, people all the time is, is uh, you know, planes overhead can be very loud. Um, the, the environmental damage I wanted to mention too is uh, World Beyond War uh, member, board member Pat Elder is on a, a tour right now talking about the environmental problems caused by uh, PFAS, which is a, a fire retardants used in uh, fighting, uh, fair fighting exercises and, and um, uh, 
So the bases which use this have a lot of uh, de degradation of their water surrounding the base, but in American bases as well. And so he's going around the country talking to people about the, the, what the, the carcinogens that they're drinking every day. So this is a problem overseas as well, except that um, the local government doesn't have much to say about it. Crime can be a huge problem. Um, th there have been you know, murders, rape, arson, uh, burglary, all those kinds of things. And also prostitution can be more common around uh, an American military base. Inflation, um, if a military base does not have enough housing units for all the people stationed there, uh, those people are given uh, an overseas housing allowance uh, to rent something off base. The, the, the American government gives people enough money that they can rent things at a higher rate than the local person. So people get, the local people get priced out of their own neighborhoods. And they can't afford to rent where they've been living uh, for some time. Um, uh, inflation, I mentioned, okay, nukes, uh, you know, a lot of countries, well, actually, I don't know how many, but other countries have American nuclear weapons on them. And this will be a huge problem if, uh, uh, if there's ever, uh, you know, an accident, uh, it could be uh, devastating. And the other, another thing that people don't think about maybe is that the bases uh, not only um, ground space is taken, taken over, but also air space and water space so that uh, Americans, excuse me, um, locals, uh, are, their fishing rights offshore uh, can be um, uh, negated and airspace. All those things uh, are, are included too in the, in the, in the confiscation of, of local um, local locales, I should say. So uh, why should we close them? Well, number one, it would improve relations drastically and re reduce the provocative presence. And, and this is one of the reasons why World Beyond War chose um, closing bases as a focus area for a group, uh, for, our, uh, for our organization is because the, these bases are so confrontational and provocative and they are um, they, they're threatening, and if we brought them all, if we closed them all, and you know retreated back to our own shores, I think a lot of countries would feel much less uh, threatened, and and would improve relations drastically. Uh, so that's something that we're working on, and and uh, because we have this international footprint with World Beyond War, we think this is a really good project for us to work on. So we'll return uh, the real estate and the fishing rights and all those things back to the locals. Uh, environmental damage would at least be halted, uh, whether or not it's, it's repaired or not, but at least it wouldn't keep getting worse. And it would be, uh, it, sh it should be done because the locals uh, don't want us there. In, in Okinawa specifically, um, about 20% of the land in Okinawa uh, is taken up with American military bases. And over 75% of the Okinawan people don't want them there anymore, but, and they've had petitions. Um, they've had a problem uh, with American planes uh, dropping parts on playgrounds, and they, they've had uh, uh, petitions to prohibit the American military from flying over um, the populated areas. So there, all those things would, would, uh, would stop if we got rid of these bases. And if those reasons weren't enough, uh, they cost uh, the American, excuse, the American taxpayers, us, you and me, about $160 billion a year to maintain these foreign bases. And uh, obviously that's money that could be well used in other, in other places uh, in our, in our uh, budget. And that's all I have for now. Uh, Greta, I'll stop sharing and you can take it back. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Leah, for providing that context about why bases are problematic. Now we're going to hear from Tom and Robert about their experiences actually shutting down military bases in their communities using nonviolent grassroots techniques. Tom Hastings got involved in the campaign to shut down the Project Elf base in Wisconsin in 1978, and it took decades of nonviolent tactics to finally shut the base down in 2004. Welcome, Tom. Robert Hi, Robert, can you Robert, see me? Yes, we can. 
Thank okay. you. Our other guest is Robert Rabin, who was part of a broad-based community leadership effort to remove the U.S. Navy from Vieques, Puerto Rico. He was arrested multiple times and spent six months in U.S. prison for nonviolent civil disobedience. The campaign succeeded in 2003 when the base was shut down. Welcome, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome to everybody who's uh, on the panel and all those who are tuning in. So you both worked on these successful campaigns to nonviolently shut down these bases in your communities, Tom in Wisconsin and Robert in Puerto Rico. And my first question for you both, and you can take turns answering this, is, you know, broadly, if you could des describe an overview of your campaign for us, what were the overarching strategies and tactics that you used? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, the Vieques struggle, Vieques is a small island off the east coast of Puerto Rico, and it's very important to understand that the discussion about Vieques and the U.S. military is only understandable in the context of the U.S.-Puerto Rico colonial reality, that colonial relationship. So it's important for people to understand that from the outset. The U.S. Navy took over two-thirds of Vieques uh, in the 1940s, part of a large-scale militarization process throughout the Caribbean, particularly in their colony of Puerto Rico and the entire archipelago of Puerto Rico, where 20 percent of the main island was taken uh, to create different military installations. Uh, a large amount of the uh, other um, uh, inhabited Puerto Rican island of Culebra also used by the U.S. military uh, for decades, including bombing practices just like Vieques. In Vieques in the 1940s, uh, again, it's important to mention that during this period when the U.S. Navy took over by expropriations through a series of U.S. congressional laws passed without any participation by the people of Puerto Rico, this is a time in the 1940s and the people of Puerto Rico did not have the right even to elect their own governor. The governor was appointed by the president and the Congress. But in that period of the 40s, the U.S. Navy took approximately 72% of Vieques land, the most fertile lands, the most important aquifers, the highest points on the topography, the most important mangrove lagoons, the closest, closest connecting point to the main island of Puerto Rico, uh, shut down the most important economic uh, entity, which was the uh, Playa Grande Sugar Mill, a, a multi-million dollar uh, sugar project. Um, and uh, the Navy began to use the eastern end of Vieques, approximately 15,000 acres on the eastern third of the island of Vieques. Vieques is about uh, uh, 20 miles long, four and a half miles wide. The eastern 15,000 acres were turned into a maneuver area and live impact area. So for over half a century, the Navy dropped bombs from jet ships, tanks, bazookas, mortars, experimented with new weapon systems, invited NATO countries, other allies, rented Vieques to private corporations to experiment with new weapons facilities. An ecological, economic, social uh, uh, destruction of enormous proportions. It's very difficult for people to protest in the 40s, the Second World War, the Cold War. Um, but in the 1960s, some university students from Puerto Rico, together with people from the Puerto Rican nationalist movement, who saw Vieques as a very important uh, um, uh, element of U.S. imperialism, colonialism, uh, got together and started to do some protesting. In the 70s, fishermen spearheaded a movement to stop U.S. Navy bombing because the fishermen were the most closely uh, uh, affected by the bombing out in the best fishing grounds where uh, they were, they could not go in when Navy restricted areas, their fishing traps were ripped up. So fishermen actually blocked NATO maneuvers in 78, 79, were arrested on several occasions. This got support from many sectors of the Puerto Rican uh, society, um, but very difficult again, still in the 70s, 80s, the Cold War. Wasn't until 1990s, uh, in particular 1999, a U.S. military jet pilot dropped two 500-pound bombs, live bombs, on a Navy's own observation post on the eastern end of Vieques, 
killing of Iacenze security guard. And that catalytic event shook the consciousness of the people of Vieques in Puerto Rico like no other event that ever done. And immediately we began to occupy the bombing range. Thousands of people literally for an entire year took over the Navy's bombing range. Uh, encampments were set up by union groups, uh, uh, church groups, so, uh, university students, fishermen's families, among others. Uh, the Navy could not bomb for a year, and finally, after a year of occupation of the, the bombing range, the Navy came in, arrested everybody, and started bombing again. And then we began a four-year nonstop, nonviolent civil disobedience action, basically designed to get people into the bombing area when the Navy was about to bomb, make the presence known, and force the Navy to stop, to hold up for an hour, for a half a day, maybe cancel for the day, uh, over 1,500 people arrested. Many people spent days or weeks or months in federal prison here in Puerto Rico. Millions of people participated throughout the diaspora and throughout uh, the entire Puerto Rican nation uh, here in the archipelago. But it was basically a, a nonviolent civil disobedience action, very inspiring because it was very dangerous. People put their lives on the line by going out to a very dangerous space. The Navy's bombing range with a lot of unexploded ordnance, many times at two or three in the morning with fishermen to get out there and, and block uh, Navy bombing and become human shields in that sense. There are obviously many other aspects of the civil disobedience process, but I know we wanna share uh, about five minutes each on this uh, question, so I'll, I'll see to Tom because I'm also interested to hear about the Wisconsin issue. Okay, thanks, Robert. Tom? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that was inspirational. Um, now, we, we started uh, our opposition to this thermonuclear command facility uh, that the Navy built uh, as a, quote, test facility in the Shawamaga National Forest in Wisconsin. Uh, they built it back in 1969, and instantly there was uh, a great deal of opposition. And what you'll find, I think, uh, again and again, as Leah has mentioned, as Robert has mentioned, these uh, installations are quite often done in the, quote, name of protecting democracy, and they are profoundly anti-democracy. Uh, so uh, that was true in, in uh, you know, in many cases like Okinawa that, that Leah uh, mentioned, uh, certainly was true for Vieques, uh, and it was absolutely true in uh, northern Wisconsin and then subsequently in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, where uh, Project Extremely Low Frequency, or ELF, or ELF, was built uh, first, as I said, in 1969, and then expanded uh, in the 1980s into the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, uh, it was joined, uh, the two facilities were joined by a 165 mile underground uh, dedicated line between the two of them. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, uh, the base was then uh, transmitted from uh, both uh, Wisconsin and from K.I. Sawyer Air Force Base in, uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So our opposition began right away. I didn't even live uh, in Wisconsin until 1978, so I was uh, nine years uh, late in getting into the opposition. Uh, during the 1970s, you could not find a single elected politician in the state of Wisconsin who supported the United States Navy in this with this facility. Uh, and it only got worse from that point on, and it was even worse than that uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan uh, when, when it came to uh, fruition there. Uh, in, and in terms of the um, uh, proposal to expand it into what was uh, going to be called Project Seafarer. Uh, uh, then the um, then President Carter told then Governor Warren Knowles of Michigan that the project would not be built against the wishes of the people of Michigan. So referenda were taken in all counties, all eight counties in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan more than 80% of the residents, of the citizens, of the voting citizens of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan were opposed to the United States Navy. So you had political opposition, uh, broad, broad political opposition in both Wisconsin and in Michigan. And yet they built this facility uh, to send uh, commands 
to the boomers, to the uh, uh, submarine launch ballistic missile carrying uh, uh, submarines. So our opposition went from protest, uh, from working, tr from trying to work with the uh, uh, legislative branch of government, from trying to work with the uh, executive branch of government. And of course, Carter was replaced by Reagan. Uh, and one of the first things that Reagan did, uh, actually after he was shot, uh, after the assassination attempt on him, uh, one of his very first acts uh, was to say that Project ELF would go forward into Michigan, would expand, uh, and uh, <laughs> again, profoundly anti-democratic. So much for Carter's promise. Uh, uh, as I said, Carter promised that it would, quote, never be built against the wishes of the people of Michigan. Yeah. So as soon as the people of Michigan were uh, overruled by the executive branch, and we had uh, apparently lost in the legislative branch, uh, both at the state level, uh, because the state was powerless, but mostly, Im more importantly, at the federal level, uh, we moved into the courts. And we organized, uh, we had a we had a nonprofit then uh, called Stop Project Elf. I was on the board of that starting in, in the late 1970s. And we, our staff was uh, quite professional uh, and we instituted a lawsuit uh, against the United States Navy, against the federal government to shut this down. And we did so on, basis, on the basis of the environmental impact statement. Uh, we were a movement that was uh, a perfect intersection between peace and environmental. Uh, because this was an environmental threat. Uh, and we actually prevailed. Uh, that uh, lawsuit, quote, trial, uh, happened in federal court in 1983. Uh, the judge took a few months to write a 69-page, uh, heavily rationated opinion, which I read at the time. Uh, it was very, uh, it was profound, and said, uh, that uh, the judge was placing an injunction on any further expansion. Yeah, as soon as that happened, the Navy ran down to the circuit court uh, in, in Chicago and twisted a few arms and got a two sentence, uh, a lifting of that injunction uh, based on, we all know what two words it was based on, quote, national security. Yeah, so, so the, uh, the government went full bore ahead with this, and we moved from protest to resistance uh, because we had obviously failed to convince the, the uh, executive with Ronald Reagan in. We had failed to convince the legislative to cut off the funding. Uh, so we uh, turned then to the civil side of court. We won and then were defeated by, uh, by the appeals court. So then we had only one avenue left within the, the broader uh, sort of de uh, democratic institutions. We're down to one institution left, and that is the criminal side. So we decided to become criminals. Uh, just like Robert talked about, uh, I, I wound up doing a couple of uh, felonies, a uh, couple of uh, acts of, of uh, they were called plowshares, where I took hand tools and dismantled part of this, uh, first in in uh, Michigan and then back in Wisconsin. So I went to court twice on this personally and other people did as well. Uh, and um, all along, we also did uh, your basic um, <laughs> invade and occupy actions of going up to the base, uh, uh, climbing over the fence or sitting down in front of it. Uh, we did this four times a year uh, and sometimes more often. Uh, but we went in on uh, MLK Day. In fact, we started doing it on MLK Day before there was an official MLK Day. We would go and get arrested uh, on actual, his actual birthday on January 15th. Then eventually we started to do it on the national holiday when, when that was declared. Uh, and, uh, and we also did it on Mother's Day. Uh, and then we had a Hiroshima Nagasaki encampment uh, every August. And then we would go uh, over the fence again on Gandhi's birthday. So between all of us, between the uh, several plowshare actions and the, uh, uh, the blockades and uh, quote trespass, uh, we put in well over a century of prison and jail time uh, in resistance to this. 
Um, I wish I could say that we were smart about it. Uh, and, um, and I wish that we could uh, claim that we had some kind of strategic, brilliant vision, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. We just knew that this was so wrong that we needed to resist it. Uh, and, and the reason I say that we had no particular structural analysis is that I've, <laughs> I've since then sort of become a scholar in this field and realized just how inchoate we were. We're very sincere uh, and, and, um, and very intentional, but we just had, we had no particular systemic uh, uh, strategy. Um, it took us as long uh, as you referred to, it uh, took us decades. It took us as long to shut down these facilities in Michigan and Wisconsin as it did <laughs> Gandhi to liberate India, okay? So um, we learned a lot. We were, Sam Day, uh, uh, the uh, dear departed, may he rest in peace, Sam Day, uh, said that we were a, uh, an academy or a school to teach nonviolence, and we did. We, we had so many uh, people from around the world come and join us. Uh, we did trainings and then resistance with Christian peacemaker teams from all over the world. Uh, we did literally a couple of generations of youth. <laughs> I was actually, uh, my final prison sentence uh, was in the mid-1990s. Uh, I went out on uh, Earth Day of 1996, uh, again, to symbolize the anti-militarism and pro-environmental stance uh, of our movement. And we cut down uh, th three of the large uh, poles that supported the uh, antenna that was then driven in the ground. And, and it was, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna get real technical about this. It was quite technical. Uh, this thing won uh, engineering awards, et cetera, but uh, we shut it down uh, for the day. And for one day's um, shutdown, we were rewarded with three year prison sentences. Um, of which we served uh, about a year in prison. The, the important piece to this that I really wanna stress though, is that we, we took a, a, almost a hiatus from our work when uh, Native American treaty rights were threatened uh, in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, most of us who were involved in, in this uh, effort to shut down this military base uh, jumped in with both feet into the treaty rights struggle uh, alongside Native Americans, alongside the Anishinaabe. Uh, and, and I did a lot of writing and, and work with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission at that point. Uh, and we went to a lot of boat landings and, and stood uh, shoulder to shoulder with uh, tribal members. We did not have any quid pro quo in mind when we did that. We just wanted to do the right thing. Uh, and we did that for about three years very intensively. Uh, the struggle uh, was longer than that. The, the whole treaty rights struggle was really from the 1970s until about 1992. Uh, but there was a furious part of that from 1989 through 1992. Uh, and we were uh, out a lot with that. So unbeknownst to us, uh, when the treaty rights struggle uh, really won, uh, not only in the courts, but in the hearts and minds of the people of Wisconsin. Uh, then the tribes decided a, a few years after that uh, to turn the, the, the awesome power of their stable of attorneys onto our behalf. And they announced that they would be uh, working to shut down this Navy facility because of uh, their review of the environmental impact statement. And they said, you, you, uh, you look at their environmental impact statement, it is woefully incomplete, it's, uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, a sham, and our morbidities and mortalities that relate to the cancers associated with uh, those produced by this sort of electromagnetic radiation uh, tell us that this is a treaty rights issue. Um, and so the Navy, interestingly, had just announced that they would be needing this facility for another 30 to 35 years. Then the tribes jumped in. Within months, the Navy said, you know what, never mind, we're gonna shut it down. 
uh, and it is now shut down, dismantled, and removed from the national forest, from the Shawamaga National Forest, and from the portions of four state forests in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So our lesson, our grand lesson in the end was unity and coalition. Uh, and that is, in the end, in my mind, how we won. Thank you, Tom. Um, okay, I have one more question for you both, and then I want to uh, move forward to Q&A with the audience and discussion as well. So I think, you know, as we mentioned, World Beyond War is a global grassroots network, and we have members in 175 countries worldwide who are concerned about military bases in their communities. So this webinar is really an opportunity to share these stories and also to share uh, tactics and inspiration for how people can replicate these kind of campaigns in their communities. So my last question, you can answer this relatively briefly, is can you sort of summarize maybe one or two top things that you would tell to an activist uh, in our network who wants to work on a base closure campaign? What are the one or two top uh, tips that you would tell them in terms of how to get started on something like this? Uh, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, I, I think um, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So I, I think uh, one of the the unity is is crucial, and in Vienkes we we had such a wide variety of leadership. This was not a one group. There were many different groups, and we were able to work together and coordinate. Not always friendly, but we coordinated, and it was really the community that made us coordinate, even though sometimes we didn't want to. Um, but the the um, uh, the unanimity of thought throughout the Puerto Rican nation was so great that we were able to uh, uh, push for and and help uh, foster uh, the creation of an ecumenical council for peace on Vieques with the participation of every bishop of every church in Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rican government, every political party, left, right, and center, they really uh, were all on board. The presidents of all the political parties sent messages to uh, Clinton and then to Bush, stop the bombing on Vieques. We were also, we had great support from the Puerto Rican diaspora throughout the United States, particularly in New York, but also in Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, among other places. And uh, a lot of, very powerful Puerto Rican politicians, particularly related to the Democratic Party, um, made this issue for the candidates uh, between 99, 1999 and 2003, the most important issue for millions and millions of not just Puerto Rican, but Latino, Hispanic voters in the United States. We had the uh, support of important uh, Mexican organizations like La Raza, uh, we had the participation of uh, people like uh, Reverend uh, Al Sharpton was arrested with us. Bobby Kennedy Jr. was arrested with us. Uh, Edward James Olmos was arrested with us. Lots of pastors, priests, nuns, uh, 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 veterans of the Forum Wars. We also had a lot of Christian peacemakers teams out here with us as well. Uh, fishermen, grandmothers, university students. It was a very wide variety of participation, but this combination of on the ground, very inspirational, nonviolent civil disobedience where people put their lives on the line in a continuous way during that four year period, inspired a lot of support and solidarity from these other sectors throughout Puerto Rico and in the diaspora and people throughout the United States and other parts of the world interested in peace and justice issues. We had visits from uh, Argentinian deputies, people from the Dominican Republic, from Cuba, from um, uh, many parts of the world came to you, from Okinawa and, and uh, Hiroshima, we had visits to Vieques. People from Vieques during that period traveled to the Marshall Islands, to Guam, to Hawaii, the Philippines, India, England, uh, Korea, uh, Ecuador, and in all of these places uh, shared the stories about Vieques and learned from other places about uh, you know, the, the multiplicity of, of, of organization and community groups fighting against U.S. militarism throughout the world. So again, this broad-based support uh, inspired by local 
action, across the board action, people participating from different perspectives, religious, environmental, political, strong support for the Puerto Rican nationalist movement, strong support from labor unions, university groups, etc. Artists of all types in Puerto Rico, there was a unique, powerful relationship of mutual inspiration between the nonviolent civil disobedience actions in Vieques and singers, songwriters, actors, play, playwrights, uh, sculptors, etc. And there was this constant production of music and artwork that was inspiring as well. So it was this really wonderful, magical period, a lot of powerful energies. But eventually, this combination of the on the ground work in Vieques uh, with powerful political action in the US. Uh, international uh, support. I mean, we had people from um, uh, the, the um, UN Human Rights Commission uh, was discussed in Geneva at the United Nations in New York, among other places, the uh, uh, Latin American Commission for Human Rights. Um, Rigoberta Menchu was here with us, uh, among other, you know, international dignitaries. And so it was this really powerful combination of work on the ground, people willing to put their lives on, uh, uh, you know, in, in danger, in jeopardy, willing to go to jail, uh, great support, well-coordinated actions, uh, uh, political action. We had a lot of lobbying. We had a lot of people lobbying, both in Puerto Rico, but dozens and dozens of people from Vietnam and Puerto Rico were in Washington during those four years visiting everybody. So it was a a well-coordinated, I would have to say, a uh, series of, of actions um, that eventually, without firing a single shot, allowed this small community of Vieques, um, you know, after this four-year intense struggle, again, part of a historic struggle that went on for decades, really, but in that period of uh, 99 to 2003, without firing a single shot, this community was uh, able to defeat the most powerful military force in the history of humanity. So we are, you know, very uh, uh, um, uh, proud of what happened here, happy what happened here, and very happy to share the experiences uh, with other communities uh, who are dealing with these issues. Again, we have, uh, we've had a lot of communication with people from Okinawa, for instance, on, on many occasions, uh, the Philippines, Guam, uh, and in the United States as well, through organizations like the Military Toxic Project, uh, people in, um, uh, in Texas, uh, 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 throughout, throughout the United States, where the U.S. military is the largest and most dangerous polluter and contaminator. Um, so again, I, I'm just thankful that we've had this opportunity to exchange uh, information and look forward to uh, sharing more with people and, and hearing what people might have to say. Thanks, Robert. Tom, one or two top tips? To me, the most important thing by far is to establish very early on a code of conduct. And this does not mean uh, that, okay, everybody has to be a pacifist. And in fact, most of the groups I've ever been in, I'm one of the very few pacifists in the peace group. Okay, but if you have a code of conduct that says for the purposes of this coalition, for the purposes of this campaign, we will be absolutely nonviolent. Then you set up a trust. You set up a whole vibe with law enforcement, with the public, so that your movement can gain momentum. As soon as you allow a so-called diversity of tactics that involves masks and violence, all of a sudden your recruitment numbers drop. You get more, quote, radicals, and frankly, uh, as a plowshare resistor, I'm not really going to take a backseat to anybody in terms of being a, quote, radical, but you get people who are labeled radical because they're willing to commit violence. Uh, then they drive away the public. They alienate the public. So to me, nonviolent discipline is absolutely crucial. We were blessed. Our original leaders in this were people who came out of the civil rights movement. Uh, they came out of Freedom Summer in 1964, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm still very good friends with them. They uh, live in, in New Mexico now, but they were the ones who brought the initial um, sort of uh, tone and tenor to our movement, and it never stopped from that point on. So uh, to me, that is something that I've observed in other movements. That is absolutely crucial. As soon as that falls away, 
then you're in trouble. You can lose your momentum and lose your recruitment. That's an excellent point, Tom. Thank you so much for stressing that. And at World Beyond War, we oppose all forms of war, all types of weapons, and all forms of violence. So for us, it is very important, as you said, to maintain that nonviolent stance. And for those of you around the world listening in, you know, we can help provide you with resources if you're looking for a nonviolence trainer, organizing trainings, for et cetera. Just reach out to us and we can connect you with those resources to support your campaign. Now I want to turn it over to Mark Elliott Stein to moderate our Q&A and discussion. Okay. Um, well, wow, I, I really um, got a lot out of hearing those stories. And I'm so glad that you emphasize nonviolence, Tom. Um, and and um, I also want to say, I'm so glad to hear about the victories, that these were successful. Um, okay, so questions. Um, Juan asks, what about the military bases in Latin America? Would one of you like to take that? Well, I, I can say at least from, from Vieques, we were very clear about the importance of the U.S. military presence in Puerto Rico, particularly on Vieques, for uh, carrying out aggressive actions against Latin American countries and Caribbean countries. So, so we were certainly part of that process. I mean, Puerto Rico, again, is a U.S. colony, but it is certainly a part of Latin America. It's a uh, Spanish-speaking culture, uh, military occupied in 1898 and controlled to this day as a U.S. colony. So in a sense, we can say that the Vieques Puerto Rico military bases are U.S. military bases in Latin America, but we you know, have extensive evidence about the U.S. Navy use of Vieques from the Second World War right up until 2003, including a long list of U.S. military interventions in Guatemala against Cuba, the Dominican Republic, among other places, the Contra uh, issue in, in, uh, in Nicaragua against uh, the revolutionary peoples in, in El Salvador. So, um, yeah, there's a very clear relationship between the Vieques and Puerto Rico military bases and Latin American uh, uh, if I could just make a, a, a quick point about, um, if you saw, remember the chart I showed you with all the military bases and you saw that uh, South America, they're, they're not nearly as many. Um, I think that that's because our enemies, so to quote enemies, um, uh, have been uh, United, uh, Russia, you know, USSR, and so there's all those bases and NATO countries there. And, and now we're shifting over to uh, in Middle East, and you see all those bases around uh, about the Middle East, and now it's a, the pivot to Asia, and so uh, Japan and, and uh, Korea, those kinds of places. But we don't have um, big, quote, enemies in South America, so uh, I think that's part of the reason that that's uh, probably the least uh, priority uh, unified command for, for American uh, policies. Great. Okay. Thank you. So Oh, let, me, let me just add into that, if I may, um, uh, a couple of brief points. One is that I've, I've always um, sort of engaged from the standpoint of if it's a U.S. base, I'm much, much more effective as a U.S. citizen operating here from the point of launch uh, rather than from the point of impact. Uh, and that's true for Latin America or Africa or anywhere else where U.S. bases have encroached. So I, I think that my own personal effectiveness is much more in our U.S. courts. Uh, I used to lobby uh, once or twice a year uh, in D.C. when I was a full-time professional community organizer. Um, and and the, this, this is where our <laughs> funding can be cut off. This is where everything emanates from. Stop it here and you won't have to worry about it there. But the people on the ground there, like Robert said, have their own uh, ways to do this. It's very hard uh, to do this uh, transnationally. Uh, uh, Joseph Gerson's been doing this for a long time. Uh, and this is the point that he made to me is that we are talking about grassroots efforts around planet Earth. Grassroots efforts don't have a lot of money. 
and it's very expensive to fund the travel. It's very tough to overcome uh, language barriers. So th those are very hard things for grassroots organizations opposing U.S. military around the world to deal with. We have to at least recognize that. Uh, finally, uh, here's my fantasy of years ago, is that uh, I teach in the field of conflict resolution. To me, I like to drill down to shared interests. That's one of the principles uh, that, that we operate with. How can we get down to things that we share so that we can devise, even if it's only a very temporary goal, uh, together with somebody we might not uh, agree with about anything else? So for example, if the Tea Party type Republicans, if, they, if they're isolationists, if they don't like US foreign bases for their own reasons, why wouldn't we form a coalition with them for this particular goal and say, let's do that together. Let's form a coalition. Let's shut down these foreign military bases. We can go back to our corners and hating uh, on each other later on when we're done with this, but we can achieve this together because we share this goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting that uh, in in the uh, mid 1990s, when the U.S. Uh, military was closing down bases in this process of the base closure and realignments program, we um, uh, met with the mayor of Vieques, very right wing pro American mayor, and we <laughs> said, "Hey, look, uh, Manuela was her name." and you know, the federal government, the U.S. government is looking to close down bases. We think we might be able to help them. <laughs> we got her to get on board with this, and she wrote a letter. We took that to the Pentagon. Obviously, they didn't pay much attention to us then, but we did go with that letter, and there was that commonality. I also want to mention uh, Monisha Rios uh, Bermudez in Vieques uh, just uh, mentions here on our chat group that in Vieques, we still have function, the Navy still has running on Vieques, a relocatable over the horizon radar, this very horrific uh, high tech radar system. And it's very clearly it being used to spy on Latin American countries. Um, uh, and obviously in, in, at these moments, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, et cetera. And, and we know about the intense constant interventions by the U.S. military uh, and, and U.S. government and using economic power and infiltration, like we've just seen recently in Bolivia, and we've seen constantly uh, uh, over the last several years in Venezuela. So there still is, in Vieques, this apparatus functioning, uh, the U.S. Navy relocatable over-the-horizon radar that's um, unfortunately not getting enough attention here, I think. So thank you, Monisha, for bringing that up. Yeah, and um, everybody should know. Uh, um, everybody should know that we can look at the chat um, window to see some other things that people are mentioning, as well as some links people are sharing. So part of this webinar experience is also what people are saying in the chat, as well as on Facebook. Um, I'm going to go to another question from Facebook now. This is to Leah, and after this, if we have time, um, maybe we can also take questions right here from the live chat. Um, so this question is to Leah from Tomas. How come they don't have to abide by local laws? Referring to what you said earlier. Mm -hmm. With the SOFA agreements. Well, it's, it's uh, it, I, I think when the United States wants to have a military presence in a country, um, they, the, there's an implicit threat if, if the host country doesn't abide, uh, doesn't follow on. And, uh, so one of the conditions, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to build your airport right here. We want to have a base, uh, and this is the way it's going to be. We're not going to have to follow your environmental concerns or whatever. Well, I mean, but the the U.S. military doesn't follow American uh, environmental concerns either. But but we are able to at least go in and inspect um, it. So it's uh, it's just an agreement that the American uh, government pushes and says no, we don't want we don't want to have, be restrained by any of your laws. So Leah, I'm sure there are um, there are incidents and concerns. How 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 much of a part of this um, campaign involves that type of issue? Um, local laws and 
Right. Well, you know, uh, this campaign, the, the World Beyond War is working on, there's really kind of two parts to it. And, and one is like in the street protesting, uh, like in Okinawa every day, there have been protests for years. Uh, so that kind of thing and helping people organize on the ground where there is a base and where there is a resistance movement. And also the second part is, is kind of working through uh, normal channels, administrative channels with Congress and the National Defense uh, Authorization, uh, trying to get amendments in there about uh, uh, closing bases and um, finding out how much they cost and whatever. So uh, World Bank War is working on a project now to identify uh, major bases uh, and all the, all the problems that each one has and uh, to try to make a priority list of ones we, we'd like to push a closure on. Uh, if anybody is interested in helping get involved with that project, um, you can email me at leah at worldbeyondwar.org uh, or leah at worldbeyondwar, excuse me, and, and I would be uh, happy to uh, have, your, have you on, uh, on the team. Yeah, I would just put in a plug and say, go to our website, worldbeyondwar.org, and click sign, and then sign our peace pledge. And when you sign, there are a bunch of different check boxes where you can check what interest area you like. So if you're interested in this issue, check bases, and then Leah will follow up with you about how you can get involved in the bases campaign. Okay, so if we have time, um would anybody here in the um, Zoom room like to ask a question? It would be best if you would raise your hand and we will unmute you, but you can also um, just unmute yourself and ask a question if you'd like. If you're on the phone, if you press star six, that can unmute yourself. Well, star um, six. And I'm just looking back at other things that people have mentioned. Um, our friend Donald Smith has mentioned that he has created a, um, a 3D interactive visualization of US military bases worldwide. I saw this is a pretty amazing um, visualization. So look in the chat window and you can see the URL for that. Um, and I'd be surprised if there aren't questions here, but if, um, if not, I have one. I would like to ask, I, I wonder if um, how to shut down a military base is, could be a, an idea for a book because it seems like a great how-to book. Um, does anything like that exist? <laughs> I, I don't know if anything exists, but you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy one step, two step <laughs> thing to do. Uh, you know, I think every base is different and and that's why there's different angles, you know, to go through uh, to try to push the point that the, the base should be closed. One, what, one is environmental damage, and that's one way to to get it. And you can get local environmental groups uh, involved too, and and push from that angle. And that's what Pat Elder is doing with the with the PFAS. Or um, you can get involved with, or uh, you can attack the problem through the cost, the cost issue, and how much it's costing uh, taxpayers, whatever. So it's, it's important to kind of, uh, each base is gonna have its own, own way to approach things, I think, uh, so you can. And I will mention too about the reason World Beyond War is focusing on foreign military bases uh, instead of closing, or we'd love to close all military bases, but American military bases on, on our soil, uh, it's very hard to close them because congressmen will not uh, agree to let a base on, in their state be, be closed. Uh, however, there, there are some Congress people that, that believe that we should reduce uh, the number of overseas bases we have. And so that's where we're, and those are the ones that really threaten other countries as well. So that's why we're concentrating on that. I'd like to mention, if I can, that uh, sure. there are uh, over uh, 30 books written about the Vieques struggle. Vieques, uh, these are books written uh, post-1999 and a few also earlier uh, from the 1980s and 90s about the military presence. And there are also several dozen very good films, documentaries, many of them international film festival award-winning documentaries about Vieques. And you can find some of the stuff at the Digital Library of the Caribbean website. That's D-L-O-C, Digital Library of the Caribbean, dloc.com slash Vieques. And you can find some of, uh, some of this material uh, um, and uh, the Vieques Historic Archives also has a, uh, a series of, uh, uh, of references 
uh, for books and uh, film about this issue of closing down the Navy base on Vieques. Well, thank you. Um, so, uh, I want to mention just one uh, action that we that we did uh, years ago. Uh, it was kind of fun, and it brings up a to me a point in terms of uh, nonviolent resistance is that there's no limit to the creativity that you can unleash. Uh, Robert talked about that with all the art, uh, and art, of course, is illimitable in terms of its creative uh, creative capacities and and expressions. Uh, so we did an action. Um, we tried to to uh, come up with different ideas so that we wouldn't be stuck in a rut doing the same thing um, uh, every time we went to offer resistance. And there was one that we did that was really fun. It was on Mother's Day, uh, where and, and Mother's Day in northern Wisconsin can still be uh, pretty snowy, uh, and uh, and and it was um, relatively chilly. But what we did was we brought baby clothes. And then we made big signs and hung them on the gates. And it said, close the base. Uh, and we hung baby clothes all across the front of it. And then uh, used that to, to uh, basically continue to promote the image of this is an anti-life, this is a, an anti-children, uh, anti-family installation hooked up to uh, a global omnicidal machine. But, uh, but using these little baby clothes was very symbolic. Uh, and it was a, the word play of close the base uh, that really to me, it was not my idea. Uh, I wish I could claim uh, that it was, but we just had a lot of creative, creative people in, in this movement uh, as there are in so many other movements. Th this is to me, one of the things to recognize is that opening it up to, to the arts opening it up to creative people and getting behind them uh, and allowing them to steer uh, the themes of this action and that action can really bring in uh, interesting media friendly um, experiences that again aid in recruitment. And you look at the empirical research on nonviolence pioneered by uh, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan and recruitment is the key. Uh, gaining numbers, gaining momentum is the key. So to me, that that all feeds into it. Well, thank you very much. And um, we've, we're going to wrap up, but we've got time for one more um, from Monisha. Monisha, I believe you're unmuted. Hi, thank you. Um, so I, as Robert mentioned, I am via Kensei, um, but I do have curiosity about how communities recover economically and in other ways once a base is closed. Um, obviously, I'm invested in my own community's recovery still because we still have open detonation of the unexploded ordinance, which still makes us sick. Um, but are there any thoughts around recovery once a base is closed? Thank you, Monisha. If I could, I, I'd like to just mention uh, you know, Vieques, the, the bombing was stopped here in, uh, on May 1st, 2003, uh, but the Navy dropped about a trillion pounds of explosives here uh, over half a century. This is according to James Porter at the University of Georgia. Everything in the U.S. arsenal from the Second World War up until 2003, including depleted uranium, among other things. A horrific process of contamination of the food chain, the water, the, the, or the land, et cetera, and the, and the people. So the highest uh, cancer case rates here. So some serious issues. And you know, over half a century, the Navy controlled two thirds of the island and basically blocked economic development. So this combination of ecological, environmental, and health degradation, together with the um, obstacles to any real social and economic development for so long, has put Vieques in a very vulnerable position right now. Um, this combined with a very um, insensitive Puerto Rican colonial government that during the time the Navy was here didn't want to touch the Vieques issue because it had a hands-off attitude. And even since the Navy left has not paid a lot of attention to Vieques post-bombing needs. So 
For instance, now a, 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 after the Hurricane Maria uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, our hospital was closed down. We have no hospital. Uh, we have a small clinic um, that's uh, improvised uh, without the equipment necessary. So a, a couple of weeks ago, a 13-year-old girl died basically because we had no ventilator here at the clinic. This death has, has shaken the uh, community up and moved people into action. The, the plaza, the public square of Vieques is filled now with thousands of uh, blocks, cement blocks that people are bringing uh, to build the hospital. Uh, mm -hmm. so this interesting community, the creative uh, ways of dealing with this. But again, the uh, vulnerable condition that Vieques is, is, is in right now, as a result of this over half a century of Navy occupation, makes it very difficult to recover economically, uh, environmentally, in terms of health, in terms of mental health, and also puts us in a, a, a much, an exaggeratedly vulnerable position in the face of the dynamics of gentrification, um, um, population displacement and population substitution. Uh, so it's, it's very uh, uh, important issues of what's, what happens in the post bomb. And once we do stop or uh, end the military activity, close down a base, then to deal with those issues of recovery is, 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 is key. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, everyone and Mark and all of the participants for joining tonight. We're going to wrap it up. We will share this webinar recording with you and we'll also put you in contact with Tom, Leah and Robert if you want to ask further questions. But thank you again for joining us. And again, we encourage you to go to worldbeyondwar.org, sign our peace pledge, check the box that you're interested in working on the basis campaign and we'll follow up with you about next steps to get involved. Thank you. Bye-bye.